Mama, Mama, Mama Mask, as they say during the theme tune. It's really nice of them to employ a singer with a stammer. Here we have another game based on another animated 80s toy advert, this time based around the mobile armoured strike command, aka Mask. Did I say A game? Well, whip me across the back with a grammar o nine tails, Daddy O. There are three of the little buggers here. Shall I break this into three then? Like the Masters of the Universe video? I could have three different episodes. Nah, I don't feel like it. I feel a bit lazy this week. So let's just take a look at all of them together in a nice little clutch. Besides, I can't remember what Miles Mayhem sounds like, so I can't do like an impression of him, like I did a really bad impression of Skeletor for those three videos, uh, which knackered my throat up. So let's just carry on with it. Let's first take a little look at the history of the source material before we wet our collective balls in the sexy juices of Mask Game. Goodness. The plot line is thus. Mask were a special task force led by Aryan hero Matt Tracker. The crew have two weapons at their disposal, transforming armoured vehicles and helmets that gave their wearers special powers. Who doesn't want to shoot stuff out of their helmets, eh? Leaving a gap there for comedy purposes, which is ruined by me explaining it. Carrying on. Normally, having such weaponry at your disposal gives you the edge on your criminal adversaries. However, Miles Mayhem leads their counterpart Venom, and they've got similar old shite. Say what you want about Venom, but they're very aware that they're the bad guys, as Venom stands for Vicious Evil Network of Mayhem. You can't beat self-awareness like that. That's quality stuff. If only more bad people would realise they're bad and just be honest about it. What an excellent premise then, with which to sell toys. Mask is indeed a greatest hits of most of the toy brands of the 80s. You've got uh, special Darth Vader and Boba Vett style helmets. You've got G.I. Joe Task Force minifigures. And you've got transforming vehicles. And colour me shocked if combining all of those elements didn't make Mask a big hit with the kids. In fairness to Kenner, the little figures and the vehicles they rode round in were of decent quality. Um, Mask was a reasonable success. It wasn't up there with its inspirations like Star Wars, G.I. Joe or Transformers in terms of its sales or its longevity, but it was... Uh, a very big success and it was definitely in that second tier with something like Thundercats though I'd argue it was slightly better than Thundercats. A total of 75 22 minute episodes of Mask were put out over two series in 1985 and 1986 and they were made by ICC TV Productions and yay I get to play it again Dick good old Dick Dick I love Dick. <clears throat> so do the games then. Over the course of two years, legendary British coders Gremlin Graphics put out a trilogy of computer games based on the series, all wildly different from each other. This is something I can get on board with, and I believe you can too. All three were released on the main 8-bit systems of the time, although it missed out the MSX on the first game. The first one, well, it has an element of repurposing about it. Venom have propelled Boulder Hill, the fake petrol station home of Mask, that's built into a mountain because it's an 80s cartoon thing and that made for a more impressive base when you bought it as a toy I guess, into a time vortex and scattered the team across a destroyed, futuristic post-apocalyptic landscape. You, as the leader, Matt Tracker, have to battle across a monochrome landscape looking for segments of a broken scan key to bring the team back together and get everyone home again. It's this plot and mechanic that has led many to believe the game to be 
tenuous and merely mask in name only, bearing a lick of mask paint, so you can't notice that it's an entirely different game, to get it into the shops while the other games were being developed. That said, it's not too bad a game. Old Matt goes about his mission in his iconic Thunderhawk sports car come attack plane. The Thunderhawk somehow manages to be cool looking despite being a plane merely by opening its doors. You fly around looking for little icons which form the scan key. They also are fellow characters and their bombs. Now the bombs can be used to blow up your adversaries but they're also often required to clear debris that stands in your way of progress. Controls are a little loose and it can be hard to line up shots and the Thunderhawk with the icons that you need to collect. They're tiny little icons. It's not immediately clear what you have to do either which is an issue that can become a bit of a running theme with the games in this series. The graphics are crisp, there is a decent representation of the theme on the title screen and the gameplay is pretty enjoyable. I don't believe it really suffers from being a tarted up version of a completely non-related game anyway. So yes, so we're off to a flyer with Mask 1. It came out to mixed but generally positive reviews. Your Sinclair gave it a 6, saying it was a disappointing cartoon tie-in that's too slow to provide long-term zapping. They tell you to wait for Mask 2, but hold your horses. I have two other reviews to look at first, your Sinclair. You can bloody well wait. Sinclair user loved it. They declared it jam-packed with puzzles to solve and enemies to destroy. That it needs patience, perseverance and more than a little luck. They gave it a 9 out of 10. Crash? They largely like Mask 1 too. It received an 81% with them and they described it as being a worthwhile license with lots of depth and playability. Moving on to Mask 2 which was released the same year, but was almost certainly a game built from scratch as a Mask game, unlike its predecessor. Mask 2 is a very different game from the first, and one that fully utilises the licenses hero team and their various shape-shifting whips. Whips is a different word for vehicles if you don't talk in turn of the century Southern Californian parlance. You're given a mission each level and you must assemble a crew of three different vehicles to handle its various terrains and enemies. Failure to pick the right man and vehicle for the job and you're stuffed. Trial and error is the order of the day here in these side-scrolling shooter levels. Don't drive a semi-truck down a river. That's just daft. That's my tip of the day. Another tip of the day is don't try and fix a plugged-in toaster with a fork. And my third is don't mistake the twerking of a running badger as an invitation for sex. Woo-wee, did I learn that one the hard way. Mask 2's graphics are pretty garish. But it is a daring use of colour that works just about okay. Uh, the music is flat out the same exact composition as its predecessor which is no great issue as it was about as good a representation of the mask theme as you can expect from Sir Clive's Wonder Machine. It's tough, the controls are a little off and overall I didn't rate it as highly as the first one despite it being a far better use of the mask license. Reviews wise, well, your Sinclair gave it an average 6 out of 10 saying it wasn't a particularly impressive shoot 'em up or get something and take it somewhere else ish type game. Man, that's really quality writing. Journalism in the 80s, kids. Crash, they were fond of it too. They found it more fun and lively than Mask 1, and they gave it an 81%. Sinclair user, though, they blew their beans all over it. Look at all that ejaculate pouring off of Matt Tracker's face. Uh, they stated that Mask 2 was an excellent sequel to Mask. Lots of hard shooting and tearing about and a brain aching selection part 2. They bestowed a laurel upon its colourful brow and anointed it Sir Nines a lot. The third and final game Gremlin Graphics put out 
for Mask was Venom Strikes Back, and that came out a year later in 1988, and was the most different of the lot. For Gone was all forms of vehicular combat in favour of an on-foot platforming adventure with Matt Tracker utilising his eponymous helmet itself in order to rescue his young son from the moon. What follows is a helmet-swapping Exelon Light, if you like. It's very similar to the classic Exelon title indeed, um, but yes, it's not quite as good. Anyway, you play the role of Matt Tracker as he charges across the lunar landscape, entering doors, evading traps and swapping out the abilities of his helmet as he battles the myriad indistinct floating robots that inhibit the world. And no, they don't explain why there are pools of water or clouds on the moon, because Spectrum programmers just didn't give a shit, did they? Crash Magazine didn't hold back in their love of Venom Strikes Back, um, praising it to high heaven and awarding it a 91% and the coveted Crash Smash. They stated that the superb presentation enhances a very playable and addictive game. Sinclair user called Venom Strikes Back exciting multi-screen action, ideal for the trigger-happy toy freak, and they gave it a 7 out of 10. Your Sinclair declared Mask as not a bad little blam em up all things considered, but informed the readership that Exelon was better and 4p cheaper. Save those bucks, kids. That seems fair enough. Which one did I like the best? Well, Mask 1. They're all very different games and fair play to Gremlin for doing something different with each one in just that two year release window. But you know what? I found the first one just about the most enjoyable, followed by Matt Tracker's Moon Jaunt in Revenge of Venom. You may prefer the second one. I did not. That was the best use of the license though. So my final verdict is OK Cartoon. OK Games and Amazing Bloomin' Toys. I wish I had some still. The little fellas there with their unpainted faces. Charming little things they were. Anyway, K, thanks, bye.